Ladies and gentlemen, to those of you who might know me, you might be wondering why I'm on this side of the debate. Why a state-educated LGBT woman who so fervently identifies as a feminist is opposing a motion that appears to promote social justice. The reason is simple. This debate is not a discussion of whether we are in support of positive discrimination as one of the many means of working towards achieving social justice. It is not a debate about whether we should scrap all quotas. And above all, it is not a discussion about whether Britain is at the moment an equal society. What concerns us here is whether positive discrimination and only positive discrimination holds the secret to eradicating equality once and for all. Ladies and gentlemen, I do acknowledge that positive discrimination can have benefits for a select few. I also accept, accept that while I am a woman, I might not be the most marginalized person out there and that I cannot speak for all marginalized people. I will, however, attempt to convey to you my own reasoning as to why I oppose this motion. First, positive discrimination only tackles one aspect of inequality. It, is, it superficially masks deep-set inequalities and prejudices and it legitimizes the claim that social justice has already been achieved. Second, positive discrimination in its usage today has encouraged the categorization of people, creating hierarchies of social privilege, resulting in a further divided society. Society continues to make assumptions based on physical appearance, limiting them to type. So, I do sympathize with our Vice Chancellor, Louise Richardson, when she says she wants to be seen as a very good vice chancellor rather than a very good female vice chancellor. A truly equal society recognizes people for their personal strengths, not simply as a box to tick in order to meet a quota. I therefore propose that it is through education and through education only that stigmas and prejudices can be acknowledged and dealt with and that this is the key to creating an equal society. But before I move on, it is my pleasure to introduce the proposition. Francis is a second year historian and unfortunately someone who it's very hard to find dirt on. <laughs> uh, I'm relieved that her speech was better than the Norrington table results of her college. <laughs> but really she's probably the sweetest person I know. She even checked with me before this evening that what she'd say about me wouldn't offend me. <laughs> but no, really, I couldn't have asked for a better student speaker in proposition to this motion, and I hope I can be a match to her. The second speaker on the proposition is Lucy Dresher. Lucy is Head of Parliamentary Advoca Advocacy at Results UK and previously worked for Sense International. She does some absolutely fantastic work with um, trying to combat stigmas around disability and working to give people from poorer backgrounds greater opportunities. Now, as you may know, there is a tradition at the Oxford Union to make jokes about speakers on the opposing team. I am terrible at jokes. So, naturally, I went to Rhyme Zone for inspiration. So here goes. I hope the pressure doesn't get to you, Dresher. Worse to follow, much worse. The final speaker on the proposition is Kate Kinnamont. Kate is Chief Ex Executive of Women in Film and Television UK and has previously worked as a TV director and producer for the BBC. She is similarly a woman for whom I have a great deal of respect. So, no hate, because I rate you, Kate. <laughs> great to have you here, mate. <laughs> Mr President, these are your guests and they are wel most welcome. I want you to take a moment and imagine a situation. Imagine you're at a job interview and you're up against another candidate who has a very similar education, experience, background, but you are chosen because of something you have no control over. Let's say it's because you wear glasses, because you're shorter than usual, because you're taller than usual, or you didn't grow up in London. You may have worked hard, but it doesn't matter. 
because it was this one thing that the employers cared about, and it was the reason you got the job. I use these examples not because they are in any way on the same level as being non-white, trans, disabled, uh, a woman, or working class in terms of social di disadvantage, but because I want you to imagine what it might be like to get a job based on a characteristic you cannot control. As someone whose competence has been questioned in male-dominated fields and who has been accused of filling a quota, I can tell you now that feeling as if you're employed for your gender or another, tra or another trait that doesn't relate to experience or competence is humiliating. You begin to question your very existence and you do not feel that you belong. You live in fear that one day someone will turn to you and say, we've made a mistake, turns out actually you're not good enough. When businesses are told that they put their, to put their own interests aside and employ less qualified people in order to pursue a wider social goal, this, is not only, this not only has a demoralizing effect on the workforce, but it can have truly damaging repercussions for society. The Stanford researcher Thomas Sowell found that people will be skeptical about visiting a black physician or dentist based on an assumption that they were admitted to university and hired through relaxed standards. This is bigotry, simple and plain. And yet it is also a view that is being exacerbated and legitimized through positive discrimination. Quotas, although they seem to put people in higher positions, only further the notion that these people don't deserve to be there. And of course, there are always ways around it. Corbyn's shadow cabinet, for example, though it is 50% women, the women all hold junior positions. Gender discrimination is a real problem in the workplace, especially with regard to maternity leave and returning to work after childbirth. But simply getting women into the top jobs does not solve this. A survey conducted by the officer provider business environment found that 27% of women would admitted they would be reluctant to hire a woman of childbearing age. Getting women into high places does not improve stigmas. The thing about misogyny see, is that it's a social condition. It's embedded into all of our brains, whether you like it or not. Um, and it's a, it's a social condition that women have too. After all, Margaret Thatcher won, was one of the greatest misogynists of them all. Indeed, I support the line the Women's Equality Party takes of pressurizing the government to introduce laws to support workers who face discrimination, laws that make it easy for women to return to work after childbirth, and most importantly, to train people on social attitudes in order to reduce stigmas around women's role in the workplace. Positive discrimination in today's society focus, uh, focuses only on the marginalized people, but in fact, it is a much broader problem than that. It is not just that women are confined to childcare roles so often because some workplaces are hostile towards women, but also because men are stigmatized for taking on parental roles. Current practices of positive discrimination also fail to account for social class because, and here's the wonderful thing, it makes the assumption that race and a lower social class status go hand in hand. I'd say that's pretty prejudiced for uh, an organization that claims to eradicate prejudice. And it is deeply naive to assume that a white working class male has more social privilege than a middle class female or a non-white male. When I graduate, the likelihood is that I will have a job, hopefully a good job. And when I come up against my white male counterparts in job interviews, because businesses are increasingly, are increasingly pressured to employ more women, I will probably get the job over the men who are similarly qualified. The employer will not take e economic background into account or look at how hard I had to work in order to get to that level versus someone who had a much lower starting point. Now seems to be an appropriate point to discuss the rather unsavory reputation of Oxford University in relation to state schools and low income backgrounds. The interview system here is of course flawed with professors being given no selection criteria and able to pick and choose the students that they will best get on with. According to a new report by Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission, as the Honourable Member of Somerville College said, while only 7% of British children go to private schools, they make up 39% of, um, of Cambridge undergraduates and 43% of Oxford undergraduates. 
So what are you waiting for? Let's grab your pitchforks and go pillage Christchurch and Magdalen. Except let's not do that because A, it's silly, and B, we'd be going for the wrong people. Oxford does, in fact, do a huge amount of access work to encourage students of poorer backgrounds to apply, including the unique summer school, funding for accommodation. They subsidise so many things, and there's, there's a grant to go on holiday if you really want it. The problem here is not Oxford. It's the state schools. I've tutored numerous students at different state schools who have absolutely no idea about careers, interviews, or even what the basic uh, format of an Oxford interview is like. State schools simply do not prepare students for Oxford. They do not tell them which are the most oversubscribed subjects or give them informed help with interview practice. I even have friends here who have told me that their school actively discouraged them from applying. As The Telegraph put it, having a pop at posh dons in caps and gowns is a lot more fun than facing up to the uncomfortable truth, isn't it? But positive discrimination is not the answer. In a highly competitive environment such as Oxford and Cambridge, where even straight A star students start to struggle, lowering standards only sets up students for failure. We see in America where universities do impose quotas for African American students, uh, much higher drop, we see much higher dropout rates of, of the African American students compared to their white counterparts. So rather than successfully gra graduating from universities that they were qualified to apply to, instead they end up dropping out and have this huge sense of failure. Positive discrimination is, as it is implemented in universities in the US and at the workplace in the UK, is the wrong method too late. The issues that we encounter in society cannot be dealt with through positive discrimination, but rather through research into both sides of the story, looking at men as well as women, white as well as non-white, and so on. In order to understand why people are mar um, we need to be reducing stigmas, not encouraging them. This is the solution to an unequal society. So how do we get there? The answer is simple, education. Prejudice starts young, and so must we. Toys are branded to gender, clothing is highly gendered, children see negative images of non-white people and disabled people broadcast across films and TV, and we are seeing the effects of media ex expectations on young people, with one in three children aged five to six saying their ideal body shape is thinner. Social change starts with panel discussions, workshops, and specialist training for primary and secondary school teachers. Proper, in-depth sex and relationships education is absolutely key in ensuring the children of today become the responsible and open-minded adults of tomorrow. And right now, only three out of 100 teachers say that they feel adequately prepared for teaching sex education. Students need to be taught about consent, changing the message from teaching girls how not to get raped to instead teaching boys how not to rape. Ladies and gentlemen, as I've said many times, this is not an equal society. There are issues that need dealing with, and positive discrimination is simply not enough. I want to quote something that Tanya Moody said at the Women's Equality, Conf Women's Equality Party conference two weeks ago. She said, it is better for 100 people to make one step forward than it is for one person to make 100 steps forward. Equality is not about getting individual representation, but rather ensuring equal opportunities for all. And this is why I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, to oppose this motion. Thank you.